So if the name of the game in the attention economy is to get your attention, what's the most efficient and effective way to get your attention? We often portray these big technology companies nowadays, these big tech tech giants as these evil puppeteers behind the curtain that kind of like manipulate us in order to get our attention. And they don't care about anything. They they can get our attention if if it's if it's if we get if if, we, if they get our attention, they give us fake news. They give us conspiracy theories. Even they kind of like give us fake uh, fake content and lies in order just to grab our attention. But if you think about how they actually do that, the ironic thing is we often also fall according to, to, to our own conspiracy theory. <laughs> we inventing one there. And uh, it's easy to think that Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and Larry Page, you know, Facebook, Amazon and Google are sitting in the basement together with the Joker and the Penguin and with a Bond villain, smoking big cigars, drinking whiskey and <laughs> laughing really nasty and thinking about <laughs> how can we dominate the world. And it's not like that in reality. That's just a conspiracy theory. So uh, actually the, these, some of these negative effects, and we will talk about right now in this segment also about fake news and conspiracy theories themselves, they come as an unattended consequence most often out of the name of this game of just trying to get your attention. And that's all. There might be the best intentions behind, but what these companies mostly do in order to see what best gets your attention is they evolve their algorithms. That is known as A-B testing. So A-B testing basically says there are two versions of a post, for example, and the question is should the headline be in purple or should the headline be in yellow? And then there are so many users, they just say, well, does the purple headline get more attention? or the yellow headline get more attention. If it turns out, well, it's version B, it's the yellow headline, well, then let's evolve that. Maybe there should be a shadow behind that. So they evolve that. It's, it's the evolutionary algorithm. Mutation, selection, and retention. Mutation, selection, and restorement's algorithm, basically. So they evolve uh, what is the optimum. Same as evolution, tinkers blindly. They're tinkering blindly, trying to see, because they have such big numbers, they can accelerate evolution over many generations, and nobody has to die, as in contrast to Darwin's real original evolutionary theory. They evolve what is the best way of grabbing your attention with this blind A-B testing. Now, one of the results is that actually at the end you confuse what people want with what they cannot help looking at. So there might be a car accident on the side of the road. Uh, and do you really want to? You cannot help looking at that, for example. There might be something really outrageous on a social media site. Do you really want to look? But you cannot help looking. So this blind, since these algorithms are blind, one, and we will talk ma about many others as well, one of these negative side effects is it basically detects what you cannot help looking at. Because the algorithm then will say, well, version A got your attention more. It doesn't know that you're completely upscare, upset or scared. It just knows that yeah, we, have, we have your attention. Great, successful. Let's keep on going with that. And that then leads to some of these stories and anecdotal and also proven tested evidence that we had in earlier, in earlier years that, for example, if a 14-year-old girl goes to YouTube and tries to look, of, uh, look at, uh, at nutritional advice of how to eat better, well, how do I get her attention for sure? The YouTube watch time optimization algorithm, which is the name of YouTube's recommender engine, well, figures out what if I show this girl a, a video about anorexia? And that will surely have her attention, right? And then, you know, a few weeks later, maybe she got dragged down this rabbit hole of anorexia. So these YouTube black holes have been a lot studied among, among uh, communication scholars, also with extremism. For example, with white supremacy and other, and other extremist cases that you guys actually get dragged because you cannot help to pay attention to these things, especially if you have a tendency before uh, and you're interested in some of these aspects before. So, and that comes to then actually, so how to do the question of how does our psyche work? So, as I said, there are not even many psychologists in Silicon Valley. Not really. It's not like Mark Zuckerberg goes to the basement with all these psychologists and tries to understand. It's this blind A-B testing. But what then the psychology of decision making, the decision if you should pay attention or not, among others, is about uh, is that these judgments, these decision making, judgment under uncertainty, 
uh, basically comes down to a collection of heuristics and biases. So the cognitive psychologist Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, for this work on heuristics and biases, together with Tversky, the late Tversky, uh, they did most of this work together, basically says, you know, cognitive psychology, if you want to understand how people take decisions and how they make judgment in uncertain situations, try to understand their heuristics. Heuristics are shortcuts and biases, which is kind of like stereotypes, right? So shortcuts and stereotypes, that's how quickly we make decisions. Kahneman has this famous recent book, or well, later book, about thinking fast and thinking slow. Actually, the thinking fast is the emotional response, it's a shortcut, and the thinking slow is the reasoning, which also has a lot of biases in it. So thinking and emotion and feeling and reasoning are both of uh, two different processes, he calls them system one and system two, that complement each other. Uh, but all of them are full of heuristics and biases. And these heuristics and biases came about because it's evolutionary very useful. They have been shortcuts. Uh, evolution, in its own blind tinkering, try to understand what are kind of like the things we have to quickly decide. If you see a tiger going around the corner, a saber-toothed tiger, it's not like you can reason about it. It's much better, it's much more efficient that you have a fear response. There's a saber-toothed tiger. And, and you should not have the time to evaluate, like, oh, should I be afraid, or is that a nice sable tooth tiger? So evolution works actually the other way around, right? We are all descendants from those that had a fear response to a sable tooth tiger. The rest got eaten by the majority, by the sable tooth tiger. So we are descendants, and that's why we have this fear response as well. And these are kind of like the shortcuts, stereotypes. I give a stereotype to something which is useful for me to react. I don't have to process this information. Reasoning as well, thinking slow, has a lot of these kind of stereotypes. So if you go to the typical um, psychology, cognitive psychology textbook, Thinking and Deciding, in the fourth edition, one of the major textbooks that's used all across the world uh, in this kind of matter. In 2008, this textbook listed 53 of these heuristics and biases. And you basically go around when you study psychological decision making and study what are the stereotypes, what are the shortcuts, what do people do, and it turns out that people are irrational, they're often irrational. We always overestimate the probability to win in the lottery, and we underestimate to get infected by a deadly virus or disease. Or we underestimate to be killed by not putting on our seatbelt. And then we overestimate, and these, it's, it's, it's so predictable that we are rational, but we are predictably irrational. So we can actually predict these shortcuts, and they have an evolutionary reason why these heuristics and biases actually are around. So if you take a course, you basically study this list, 53 it was back then. In 2010, I worked for quite some time in that field of, of uh, judgment and decision making and, and research and wrote some papers about it. And back then, I just recently looked back at my research from, from these many years back. And in 2010, I counted 71 of these biases. So I identified some more than there were in the textbooks that other research and uh, newer research had identified. And that was back in 2010. If you look in 2020 on the Wikipedia, there's a Wikipedia page, I invite you to go there, a list of cognitive biases, you count about 200 of these biases. So we understand cognitive biases also much better. Last but not least as well, because we are studying human behavior a lot, and we have studied it a lot during the 10 recent years, especially because of the digital footprint that's left behind, and that allows us to understand like these little quirks that humans have in their judgment and decision making, which are predictably irrational. And that's what these machines are really good. They allow us to predict. And they allow us to predict um, actually where I, where I can get you. So if I, once I can predict you, I can also get you and I take advantage of these biases. So this blind A-B testing, what it actually led to is it identified some of these biases. As I said, there are not many psychologists in Silicon Valley. It's not like somebody went in there and programmed, you should take advantage of their weaknesses. No, they just tested it and kind of like it found that, that weakness and that's where it says, well, that's an optimal. That's how I, if I hook you like this, I get your attention. If I show you a video that induces fear or anorexia or something completely outrageous, outrageous I find your attention. And because we are drawn to that, we are drawn to extreme events. That's another one of these cognitive biases, uh, for example. So let's look at, talk about a concrete example, misinformation. What is this misinformation phenomenon that people are really upset about, actually? How does it draw from cognitive biases? Well, first of all, let me start with saying misinformation became 
a, a very important problem. If you ask, if you ask uh, the population in the United States, they say that made-up news, fake news, or mi misinformation is more problematic, they say, than violent crimes and climate change and racism and illegal immigration, terrorism, and sexism, and so forth. So fake news, made-up news, is, 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 is very worrisome to people, more than these other very real-world, long-term standing problems that society is, is fighting with. So that's how far this, this paradigm of, of, of fake news and misinformation has already come. So how does it go? So let's go to our Wikipedia page of the 200 cognitive biases that we have here. Let's scroll through and see if we can find some cognitive biases here that can help us to explain that. Well, one of them is the confirmation bias. That's one of the oldest biases that we know. Um, going back to Francis Bacon in 1620, already said, an opinion draws all things else to support and agree with it. So the opinion draws all things else to support and agree with its opinion. That was in 1600. In 1800, uh, the philosopher Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, said, an adopted hypothesis gives us the lynx eyes for everything that confirms it and makes us blind to everything that contradicts it. So what this confirmation bias says is that if it confirms what you, that basically the, the previous belief that we have selects your attention and you pay more attention for the evidence that actually confirms your previous belief. So if uh, in, in, the, in the digital media age, if we bring it to that, there are some recent studies about that too, and it says that if some kind of media post confirms your previous belief, you're 88% less likely to identify it as fake. So I basically show you uh, two or three or a bunch of news and I say, which one do you think is fake and which one do you think is real news? And you are 88% less likely to identify the fake one as fake if it agrees with your previous information, with your previous opinion. Now that's a lot. And even worse, 70%, 69% of your memory will be more robust even when you alerted that it was misinformation. So I show you uh, a misinformation use and later on I tell you, you know what? Forget it, I was just kidding. That was just fake news. If it confirms what you already previously believed, you're 70% less likely to, to actually then remember it as something fake. You will wipe away my warning that it was fake news, and you will continue to insist that actually you saw that in the news, right? So this confirmation bias is, is very important. Now, the confirmation bias as well has a long historical, uh, historical meaning in, in evolution. Because somehow, you know, reality is really infinite, and somehow we have to make sense of reality. We have to cognitively construct reality. So it's important for us to reconfirm what we see around here with each other and among us to make sure we speak all the same language, like we see the same things. Reality, as we know, is not really, really how we perceive it. Again, ask a bat or ask an electrical eel, you know, they see reality quite different. So for us to get along and for us to be like, are we on the same page? Are we like, are these laws still the laws that we actually like agree with? Most of our conversation as a communication scholar, we know for a long time that most of our conversation that people are having especially is, is, is basically reconfirming reality to each other. That's what we mostly talk about, right? We reconfirm that to each other and that's useful. So. The husband stands up in the morning and says, you know, I'm going to work now. Why does he say that? The wife knows, of course, that he's going to work. But they're just reconfirming reality. So most of the communication is actually about this reconfirming of reality. And that's important for us in order not to go completely nuts and get lost in this, you know, whatever. Starting to see strings of string theory or some kind of other aspects of hallucinations that we might, might see. But reconfirm what we actually collectively hallucinate, you might say, as well. So confirmation bias is very important for us as a species to make sense of, of reality as it is. And evolutionary-wise, we are all descendants of those who paid more attention to things that we confirm because they were quicker to advance and find agreement of how to make sense of this you know, mysterious reality. So that's one uh, bias. Uh, there's another bias, the novelty bias. We are all descendants of those that pay a disproportional amount of attention to something novel. And we know that so surprise attracts humans' atten attention. That is very well known and established even before the digital age. We knew that. Uh, 
again, because you had to pay attention to something new. The rest got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So we are descendants from those that jumped and paid attention to something new disproportionately. Because if things are as usual, well, there's very little danger in there. So that's how evolution actually uh, evolved this cognitive bias in us. Now, if you bring that to the digital age, do you know that false, false news spreads six times faster, goes 20 times deeper, so it's much more likely to be retweeted, and two times broader than other news? How's that relate to the novelty bias? Well, it's much more likely that something fake is novel. Because you never heard of such an outrageous, you know, crazy idea, which, by the way, also turns out to be fake. So if there is a pandemic and I would tell you, no, wash your hands, well, that's not really new. But if I tell you, drink a lot of Clorox, and in, like that is kind of like, whoa, that's new. I never heard of that. So you pay attention to that just because it's novel. It's something, something as crazy that you have never, never heard. But of course, it's fake news. Don't drink Clorox in order to try to kill a, 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 a virus, right, especially an airborne virus. So, um, but you, people pay much more attention to this, primed on the same mechanism that saved us paleolithic emotions-wise from the saber-toothed tiger. So let's see how the novelty, uh, novelty effects turns out then in social media. Uh, we, we get kind of like get addicted to something novel all the time. Studies show that actually of the retweets that we do, up to 70% of the headlines that we retweet, we never even open it. We just read the headline and retweet it. And all of us are guilty of that. You surely forwarded or reposted something that you did not really click on and read. It might be completely fake news, but you like the headline. And 70% is a very high percentage that we don't even look at the content, but it's something novel. Something novel, something novel, a novel headline, and then we just share it. Um, so the man who actually built the retweet button, he famously said, well, the retweet button is kind of like, we handed a loaded weapon to a four-year-old. These paleolithic emotions from the bottom of our brainstem that drive us, uh, get us to retweet things that we don't really understand, feeding into phenomena like, for example, misinformation and fake news. So let's go to the confirmation bias. I was already hitting on YouTube uh, a little bit with the example of anorexia. YouTube is famously breeding ground for conspiracy theories. If you think about that the Earth is flat or that the moon landing was just like a staged Hollywood production, the first moon landing, or that you can use a hairdryer in order to kill coronavirus. So in YouTube, you find all of these conspiracy theories, all of these fake news that are, that are made up. And you think like, well, conspiracy theory, that's kind of like a very, you know, a, a very rare phenomenon. Who really falls for the fact that the Earth is flat? Well, it actually became a very big movement, same as that the moon landing was basically a staged Hollywood production. So if you look at YouTube and YouTube, Google, uh, the mother company has been aware of that for a long time and they've been fighting that for years now. They've been fighting these conspiracy theories for years and really try to bring them down. Make sure that their recommender algorithm, remember their watch time optimization algorithm is basically programmed in order to optimize watch time, in order to get your attention. Every second you spend more on YouTube is real cash for them in the attention economy. So sending conspiracy theories around might probably will uh, foster that goal of getting your attention and for you to stay longer on that web page but has some other unintended side effects so youtube then kind of like manually went in and tried to get conspiracy theories out and they did a lot of work and there are several blog posts that you can read about on the youtube page all the effort they did and they brought it down in, 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 some, in recent years down to like, let's say 5%. So fi only 5% of the recommendations on the YouTube recommender engine is now coming from misinformation or from conspiracy theories. Um, and that is when you're locked out of your account. So all the statistics that you see here is when you're locked out of your account. As I said, the digital footprint, you don't need to be locked in. That's just like the cherries on top of the cake. The cake is just every digital step you take where you where you're monitored by these kind of companies like Google and like Facebook. All right, so let's see only 
uh, of the recommendations are misinformation or conspiracy theories. So that's actually very low, like only 5%. What do we worry about that? So let's, let's look at these numbers. So on average, the average YouTube user uh, watches 40 minutes per day YouTube. 70% of what people watch is recommended by, by these algorithms. So 30 minutes a day, 70% of 40 minutes, is what the average YouTube user ends up watching being told by this artificial intelligence, right? The artificial intelligence decides what this person watches by predicting its behavior, making prediction of what would this person like to see next. So 30 minutes a day, your day is dictated by artificial intelligence of showing you new videos. Okay, so if we say 5% of that is fake news and conspiracy theories, that's a minute and a half a day. That's not too much, but we have 2 billion YouTube users and there 25%, a quarter of the world population watches YouTube. So that's on average 2 billion people, 2 out of 7.5 people that watch a minute and a half fake news a day. Now 2 billion people, that's a lot. That's the amount of Muslims in the world is 1.8 billion and the amount of, uh, amount of Christians in the world is 2.2 billion. So it's right up there with the amount of Muslims and Christians. I, I actually ask myself, I don't know if the average Christian or Muslim spends a minute and a half praying, praying in order to reconfirm his or her beliefs to this religion. But what we have here is that a minute and a half, the average follower of devotee of YouTube consumes misinformation and fake news. So that's a massive, a massive phenomenon that we're talking about here, right? Who sure, which surely has an effect. So even so the numbers are low of misinformation and fake news, even if it's like 5%, even if you bring it down to 1%, right? It has such a big, it has such a big scale and effect that these, that the power of these persuasive technologies like these recommender algorithms are so big that it certainly has a big effect of how society keeps on evolving in the future.